and it can be incredibly frustrating to uh, put out a piece of work and it not be perceived quote unquote correctly. Right. But for me, that becomes a question of, okay, where did I go wrong? What, if I thought I was putting this out there a certain way, why is it not being perceived that way? And it becomes an analysis of myself, of the readers and the climate at the time, you know, what's going on in the world affects our perception of how we're going to characters defense. Uh, very, very fringe related. There was an old Sonic cover where he's drowning in oil and the issue came out during the time of a really bad oil spill. And the public perception, at least at first, was that it was an environmental commentary at the time, except the cover had been in production six months before the boat could get. Right. There was no way we had any idea that it was going to sync up like that. Uh Uh-huh, sync. (laughs) But again, you know, our intent was Sonic's drowning in oil. That's exciting. You want to read this issue now. And the public perception was, ah, it's commentary on ecological disasters. No, that is patently wrong. There is no correlation, but it's still the public perception that we cannot control and have to take into account. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of looking back at older things from where the creators are no longer alive. It's kind of a similar thing where you're like, what did they intend here? Was that did this just happen to does this just happen to sync up with what we're thinking now or what they were thinking back then? Or is this completely different? We don't really know for sure. And then there's also like where things just magically happen to line up, like the example you gave, where it's like uh, something happens in the world and then you release a piece of media that's all of a sudden seems very likely that it was inspired by real life events even though it most likely wasn't just based on its production time and so. while i wanted to steer this topic mostly in general and not right back to sonic because we send, spend so much time on sonic <laughs> I, you also have to take into account uh the reader's bias yeah because any single issue you can there are folks who adamantly believe that you can read it as proof that I have a very strong Sally bias or that exact same issue is very clear that I have an Amy bias. And that's not (laughs) ribbing all these people that that's their perception of it. And it can be kind of fascinating to see the exact same issue, the exact same scene, same dialogue being perceived so radically different because of reader bias. Yeah. And usually it's not meant to incite either side. I'm just trying to tell the stupid stories. Yeah. There you have. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, perception. yeah, yeah. There's, there's like the argument that you're like, oh, you, you don't like the freedom fighters. You never want them ever again. And it's like, oh, mm, yeah. yeah. Mm, I don't think that's true at all. That's why I, I hate the freedom fighters. That's why the next universe arc was going to be devoted to the freedom fighters. That's. Mm. <laughs> I don't feel like you hate any of the characters in the comics specifically no, that you've written. I, don't. I mean, the running the running gag is I hate Marine because she was so weird. But that that's the joke. That's right. That's the funny ha ha. You have to. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's okay, I guess. But I mean, come on. <laughs> you have to, you have to take the public perception into account, right? So I know that there are th- those groups that will read it a certain way. And do I write with that in mind, attempting to navigate around them? Or do I just write it in a way that I think will work, knowing that I'm not going to be too able to be without being able to appease either side? And if I take that kind of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, is that going to really be to the benefit of the work? Is that going to work for the general audience? Or is trying to tune out certain groups going to make it less of a story? Sure. Now, do I need to listen to those sides and see what their points are and evolve from there? I it's it's not an easy answer. <laughs> no, no, it's not. And you have people that get very passionate and very angry no matter what. So, 
<laughs> that's what makes it really difficult. So I completely understand it's it it can be frustrating, but it can also be enlightening too. Like, you know, people point out things in ways that maybe you weren't expecting and it's interesting. Then and then it's extremely validating when I put out something and the majority seems to get it. Oh, that too, yeah. That they're in agreement with my vision and together enjoying this one idea together as one unified <laughs> as this great and terrible force moving out across. Now, I mean, <laughs> Thanos? <laughs> it, it, it feels good to be in simpatico with other people, especially on a creative endeavor. Yeah. Nope, I can definitely understand that too. So. I thought I'd make this unscripted in on my old channel since I thought, you know, people still are subscribed to this channel, so I thought, let's give them something who are still subscribed. So I will. And this thing is going to be unscripted, so, uh, yeah. But the clip you just saw was from Ian Flynn's recent Bumblecast, referred to as Writer Intent versus Public Perception. And Ian makes this huge case about how. Oh, it's all about various things, and yada, yada. It's just excuse after excuse after excuse. He mentions the room at one point as a means of his defense. What got me, though, was the fact that he said, Oh, no, I, I love the Freedom Fighters. If I didn't love the Freedom Fighters, I wasn't going to make an entire arc based around him. Well, as you said, you were working to get rid of those guys. And that's where I want to start first. And I'm going to play the clip just to show you Yes, he was trying to get rid of them. So, yeah, that would be fun. And next question comes from Mike B. Would you be able to tell us exactly what happened when you guys had to reboot the comic and why John Gray said that you needed to fight to keep the Freedom Fighters in the new continuity? Uh, I don't know how many specifics I can get into because, you know, here's something that folks don't seem to understand. I think we're going to be coming back to that with later questions is there is private talk between businesses that remains private because it's business talk and we don't really let it out because it becomes huge talking points online and it just becomes a headache. Uh, with the reboot, there were a lot of circumstances and my ultimate goal was to keep the feel of the old style of stories while doing something that was more faithful to the games. Because ultimately, that's where I was taking the book anyway. Right. And this was just the fast-forward button. Uh, the issue with the Freedom Fighters is that they are from an old, defunct spinoff from the franchise. They're not really considered high-value properties, I guess, in terms of the overall franchise. Because as much as you may love Sad I Am it doesn't really reflect what Sonic is. Not now, and not for a while. Right. So, Sega wants anything representing their product to be clearly representative of that product. Having stuff that diverges from that is not good. That said, they have given us an extremely large amount of creative license with this series, even post-reboot. And I also remember how you said in the commentary that public perception can influence a writer. And what he goes on about this is that Tommy Weiser went on ahead and said that The Room was a black comedy because the public was saying The Room was a black comedy. No one in the public eye was saying The Room was a black comedy. Only Tommy Wiseau said that. The actors said it was a serious drama. Everyone else has perceived it as a serious drama. The only person who has said it was a black comedy was Tommy Wiseau, and that was to make himself seem more clever than he actually was. And I think that's the same thing here, is that, let's also keep in mind, is that you wanted to make Bunny rap out a villain on her own accord. You made Sally a robot who couldn't fight for jack shit, especially against Amy Rose. You wanted to push Son Amy because you thought Son Amy was perfect, and that Son Ally was just a... On again, off again, generic relationship. And let's also not forget the fact that you had Sally shot and you made her completely useless and incompetent, but all the Sega cast, including Amy and Sonic, were perfect. 
They couldn't do any wrong, and they were perfect for each other, like a fucking perfect couple from the 1950s sitcom. And there's also the fact that you want Antoine to die. That was a thing that was going to happen. Oh, and Rotor? Oh, yeah, by the way, did I forget to mention they wanted Rotor to be an inventor who was also stupid? Who had no idea what the hell he was doing and made very stupid decisions? I think I did, because you said many of these things on your own Bumblecast and on your own fucking forums. So, yeah, you have absolutely no reason to talk about loving the Freedom Fighters when you yourself were essentially working to get rid of them, and that arc you were talking about was supposed to be their last fucking appearance, since, as you said, you were working to get rid of them since they were from an old defunct spinoff and were not important whatsoever. But let's just ignore that. Let's just ignore that. And I still can't get over the fact that he used the room as an example. I mean, that's... That's just really fucking dumb. No one in the history of existence has ever said The Room was a dark comedy. No one, except Tommy Wiseau. Not God, not Jesus, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Zeus, not Thor, not Zardoz. Nobody has said this was a dark comedy. Nobody. And I think he was only using this to deflect from this Game Informer article. And as he said, straightforward stories, lots of cinematic action early on. No long monologues or deep world building, no heavy focus on lore or backgrounds. It's focused on the adventure, and we have a hand on building on that. Okay, I didn't say it exactly right. I kind of messed it up at the end, but I mean, that's what he says. That's what he said. No world building. And here's this tweet. Where he says that the point of the first four issues and why they were so repetitive was because... World building. And character development. Not action. Because, yeah, that's what we were promised in the Game Informer interview. Character development. And here's a clip from the same video where he also talks about how... The Freedom Fires are Sega's property and that they could give them the boot at any point in time. So, Ian talking about the whole legal issues, complete bullshit, because he said himself, they are Sega's property. I just thought I'd point this out because I didn't point out in the last video I made, so here's the clip. Right. But at any given point, because it is Sega's property, they could say, you know what, we don't want them anymore. Give them the boot. And I would have to, because that's just... And uh, here's a clip where he discusses the sales. Right, and our last priority question comes from Chris A. Hey, Ian, are fans starting to like IDW Sonic? Uh, that is an understatement. <laughs> I was going to say, I just got the announcement today that um, uh, it's sold out everywhere. <laughs> In case you hadn't heard the news... Sonic 1 through 4, all of them have gone into a second printing. Uh -huh. And Sonic 1 has gone into a third printing. Yes. Each individual issue has sold more than any of the old run by a large margin. And the numbers that are public right now are focusing mostly on the primary cover physical sales. Not really the incentive covers, not the digitals. So the numbers that we are seeing are the low end of the spectrum. Yeah, and that's pretty normal. And these are all full-priced individual issues within the course of a month. Yeah. It would make perfect sense for folks to get kind of burned out financially. But no, 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 no. You guys... <laughs> you guys kind of went crazy go nuts. So, as I've said on Twitter, I am humbled and so very thankful that you have made IDW Sonic just an unprecedented success. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I've only contributed to one of those sales numbers because I only have one primary cover. The rest the rest of my issues are all uh um alternative covers. So <laughs> you're welcome, That's I fun. guess. You're welcome, I guess. So now you've yeah. made you you have even more sales. You can add on three more. <laughs> I'll be sure to there. let the bosses know. Okay, good. Hey, guys, let him know. Kyle bought comics. Well, you can just add it in your head. You don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, 
<laughs> you don't have to tell them. You can just whenever they say that, you can say plus three known other <laughs> sales. <laughs> And then, of course, you have all the digital sales, which I really wish they would release numbers of, because I think so many comics would have so many more sales if they would actually make the digital sales known. Yeah. But alas, I kind of understand that the brick and mortar stores are uh, reticent to allowing that to happen. So, And the publisher, by which I mean the publisher, because there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so in the same issue you talk about how the comics are selling like cheesecakes or something uh, i wouldn't even say that because yeah the first one sold pretty well although the whole iw saying that the digital sales ran out of stock is like wait what doesn't even make any sense how do you run out of digital stock it doesn't make any but yes the physical sales yeah that sold out people were excited for this new comic because like sega was hyping this thing up like crazy but they never bothered to try to advertise their archie issues kind of bizarre but i mean there you go now the first issue sold over twenty one thousand copies so that was that was pretty good i, I admit that's very good Although, the other three issues sold about half of that, so that's not really a very good comparison to make. Because you kinda lost a pretty big chunk of customers there, because, you know, you kinda blew everything on the first issue, and wasted a lot of things you could have done in one run, and, you know, you just kinda wasted everyone's time, you know? It's just kinda... Kind of something you should have worked on. You had, like, what, 17 months or something to get that whole thing straightened out? Over a year or so, not really anything that can be excused from this. Yeah, making excuses isn't gonna fix the issue, Mr. Flynn. It's not gonna work that way. This is why I criticize you, because I've read things... Well, it's not the entire reason of why I criticize you. I mean, you did lie a couple of times. So, that was the first reason, and then things just kind of piled on. But the point I'm getting at here is that you're capable of writing good issues. You just don't ever choose to. Most of yours is just mediocre. It has something going on, usually, but this is just... What's the purpose of reading all these issues? I mean, I liked issue 4, but it's the same as all the other issues. Except Tangle is there, but she doesn't serve any purpose. Why? I mean, it's very blatant that nothing interesting has happened here. And you've called people saying, oh, this is formulaic, insulting. Like, you've been saying that they are insulting. Like, how are they insulting? I don't get that. I mean, I can understand why you'd say maybe I'm insulting because, you know, I've constantly talked about how you have a ton of problems. You need to fix them. But going after someone who is in fairly positive, not even really positive, but lukewarm to the book, suddenly they're insulting. What? Just, just stop. Because that's not going to drive away customers who are paying you money and keeping food on the table. I mean, I know you're working on TMNT and Superman, but you still got to make money. And, you know, you're going to lose a lot of money by doing this. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm just saying. Because sending people to attack your fans and calling people insulting for no good reason isn't going to fix the issues that you've had. It's not going to fix it. No excuses, Mr. Flynn. No excuses. You keep making excuses, people are going to continue criticizing you. You want people to get on your bad side? Well, you pull stunts like this. Stop. Just stop. And also, if anyone is currently watching this on my subscriber accounts, I'd like for you to go on ahead and subscribe to the Rhodesian Raccoon. I 
second channel. I'm trying to move content like this over to here or over to there because I don't really want to keep using the same account that I use to subscribe to other channels really and like things on. That's uh, I, I want one for business and one for casual stuff. So Rhodesian Raccoon, go over there if you want to see more content like this because you'll get it there. You'll get it here, too, for a little while, but uh, I'm moving kinds of this over to there, so go on ahead and subscribe if you haven't already.